I grew up hearing about the Illuminati everywhere. From DVD sermons to internet memes. Everyone was supposed to be part of this grand plot. From Beyonce to the Clintons to Jay-Z and Kanye. The subliminal messages were supposed to be everywhere. From music videos to animated Disney movies. Hidden in plain sight. And a shadowy group of politicians, celebrities, media moguls and businessmen were responsible for it all. Steering the world towards the end of days. The Illuminati wave is not as popular as it once was in the 2000s and early 2010s, but the ideas it links with, like the NWO and QRSTAN1, persist to this day. I'll be using Illuminati theory as an umbrella term for the massive cluster of ideas, sometimes contradictory, that weave in and out of a variety of these conspiracies. However, I won't spend much time delving into the nuances of any of these theories, because their rabbit holes are meant to go on forever. It would be easy to get stuck in the details and end up months deep in 4chan threads, shady websites, and Facebook mom groups. I don't need to know every particular, often changing detail for every theory that's out there in order to understand and critique the big picture presented. I don't believe in Illuminati theory. I never have. But on some level, I get it. Our world is violent, our people exploited, the pain apparent and leaders corrupted. But I don't think Illuminati theories are the best explanation. Like most stories we use to make sense of our world, they may contain a kernel of truth, a truth we'll uncover as the video progresses, but ultimately I see them as distractions. I believe these conspiracies impede our understanding of the systems around us and deprive us of our ability to act against and beyond such systems. With the right tools, right understanding, right action, we can make this world a better place. We don't have to resign ourselves to the fate prescribed by this all-powerful Illuminati. So let's get into it. Where Illuminati theories come from, how they gained popularity, why they don't work, and how we can move and build beyond them. Most Illuminati theories share about three major pieces, implicitly or explicitly, which combine to tell more or less the same story. One, a shadowy group of powerful people who go by different names, but most popularly, the Illuminati. Two, anti-Semitism. And three, the Antichrist. Let's start with the first piece, the Illuminati. The OG Illuminati, the namesake of this group of conspiracies, was a Bavarian boys club founded in 1776 that sought to free the world from all established religious and political authority. The leader, Adam Weishaupt, wanted to get rid of the kings and the churches that had dominated Europe since the Middle Ages and make room for new forms of commerce, science, and democratic government that were struggling to emerge at the time. See, that was the time period known as the Enlightenment, when the old order was breaking down and a new social system, with new ideas and new innovations, began to emerge. The merchant class was rising to the top, as their wealth began to supersede that of the old aristocracy and nobility. In this period of rapid change, with all sorts of new ways of thinking, developed by folks like Rousseau, Hobbes and Newton, there were lots of groups springing up at the time, trying to push things in one direction or another. The Order of Illuminists was just one such group but they didn't actually succeed. They were repressed by the authorities and disbanded around 1787, just over a decade after their founding. Like so many other groups of their kind, the Illuminists failed to bring about revolutionary changes. But revolutionary change happened without them. The French Revolution overturned the feudal order in France. The Haitian Revolution overturned the slave economy in Haiti. Parliaments were established around the world and aristocrats were killed in droves after centuries of their unceasing rule over the people. It was after this period that conspiracies about the Illuminati began to emerge. People who were invested in the old system, like the clergy and aristocrats, didn't like the revolutions and changes that were happening at the time, so they sought to explain how they came about. A Jesuit priest named Ab Augustine Baruel and an English scientist named John Robison 
both disliked the changes being brought about by the French Revolution. They didn't believe it was possible for millions of people to mobilize together and change the conditions of their lives. To them, ordinary people were too stupid to pull off a revolution, so they needed an elite group to pull their strings. Baruel and Robison pinned the blame on the Illuminati, which they claimed hadn't actually dissolved, secretly led the French Revolution, and was still hiding in Masonic lodges, planning to overthrow governments across Europe and America. Speaking of Masonic lodges, a lot of Illuminati theories focus on the Masons. The original Order of Illuminists established itself in Freemasonry groups, called lodges. But Freemasonry had existed for a few hundred years before them. In the 1300s, craftspeople like bakers, masons, weavers, blacksmiths, cobblers, and so on, began to organize in groups called guilds, which controlled who could carry out their trade and how their trade operated in their particular towns. They enjoyed being exclusive, inventing secret rituals and symbols to distinguish themselves, like a group of children coming up with a secret handshake and code words. However, as industrial capitalism developed, most of the guilds slowly broke down. New technologies made their outdated tools and skills irrelevant, and most disappeared. However, Mason guilds, who operated out of Masonic lodges, were different. In the 1700s, Freemasons began recruiting the rich and powerful in order to maintain their exclusive status, and slowly evolved from a group of stoneworkers to a social group for rich folks and intellectuals discussing ideas during the Enlightenment. Individual Freemasons, but not Freemasonry as a whole, would go on to take part in the American and French revolutions, fueled by the ideas they developed in those lodges. Because of the association between Freemason groups and Enlightenment radicalism, anti-revolutionaries, like the elite aristocrats and clergy, saw these groups as the enemy, orchestrating these revolutions from above. Again, they didn't believe the common people might actually be able to revolt against their oppression without help. To this day, there are Masonic lodges all over the world, even in my little island of Trinidad. But they're really just stuffy clubs for old rich business people. They don't need to plot to take over the world. They just understand their position as a class with particular class interests and work to maintain those interests. More on that later. Another important piece of the Illuminati theory trifecta is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is the distrust, prejudice, and hatred towards Jewish people. It's a sentiment with a history stretching back hundreds of years, particularly in Europe. In fact, it took the horrors of World War II for the Roman Catholic Church to drop their position on Jewish people's collective responsibility for the death of Christ. Even though, you know, the Romans were the ones who actually did it. Anyway, because people hated the Jews so much, they were barred from participating in most aspects of European society. But Jewish communities found ways to survive at the edges of society, doing the work that the rest of society frowned upon, like lending money. Eventually, the entire Jewish diaspora became associated with the money-lending profession, whether they did so themselves or not. Under feudalism, the profession wasn't as powerful as it is today. But as capitalism developed, forcing millions of people off the land into the new industrial cities of Europe to work for poverty wages, the profession grew in importance. Jewish people became the scapegoat for capitalism itself. The poor workers were angry about their treatment under capitalism, but saw Jews as a bigger enemy than their exploiting factory bosses. And the small business owners who wanted to become big business owners and exploiters saw Jews as standing in the way of their goals. European workers and small business owners alike, despite their opposing class interests, both united in their hatred of the Jewish community. And as a result, the early 20th century especially was a period of violent lynch mob attacks on entire neighborhoods of Jewish people. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is one particularly influential document in many Illuminati theories. It outlines plans to take over the world, supposedly written by some secret cabal of Jewish people. However, the document was most likely written by members of the Russian secret police sometime between 1897 and 1903. At the time, Extremely anti-Semitic Russian nationalists were fighting to preserve the Sodom of Russia. 
They believed that the Russian revolutionaries were controlled by Jewish people, so they tried to foment anti-Semitic sentiment and prevent revolt in the country by creating a fake document with a dastardly plan and claiming Jewish people wrote it. Of course, the Russian Revolution occurred regardless, but not before the massive lynching campaigns against Jewish people across early 20th century Russia. Even today, people consciously or unconsciously connect Jewish people to mass movements through Illuminati theories involving George Soros, the Rothschilds, and or the Bilderbergs, as the ones pulling the strings and running things behind the scenes of mass environmental, anti-capitalist, and anti-racist movements. Last but not least, the final major piece of most Illuminati theories is the Antichrist. The Antichrist refers to a particular figure or spirit or group of people who would oppose Jesus H. Christ and try to take his place before the second coming. Illuminati theories are often tied to end times theories, which arose out of a comparatively recent mid-1800s religious movement called Protestant Millenarianism, which had a major focus on the second coming of Christ and getting ready for it. The Book of Revelation, the source of most end times ideas like the Mark of the Beast, was of prime importance, alongside the rest of the Bible, of course, as it guided what signs of the times one must look out for. These signs are mostly pretty vague, including things like wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters, and pestilences, which are, unfortunately, all pretty common throughout human history. The major sign end time theorists look out for, however, is the Antichrist a future dictator or group of rulers who are said to take control of the world before Jesus comes back. The American evangelical movement, which has quickly gained popularity worldwide thanks to missionary work and televangelists, draws heavily from the Protestant millenarianism. Thanks to the world wars, the Great Depression, and the rise of fascism in the early 20th century, evangelicals believed that the end was truly drawing near and began looking for the Antichrist in the flesh. Some saw Benito Mussolini as the Antichrist. Some saw the new invention called the computer as the Antichrist. Some saw the formation of the UN as a sign of the incoming one world government. Some saw microchips and laser barcodes as signs of the mark of the beast. And some saw Barack Obama as the Antichrist. In essence, any popular political figure, any transnational organization, and any new unfamiliar technology can be adopted as evidence for a theory people really want to believe, regardless of reality. The Illuminati, anti-Semitism, and Antichrist truly combined to create the foundation of modern Illuminati theories in the 1920s, as socialist workers' rebellions against capitalism rocked the world and World War I destabilized entire countries. In this time of great unrest, just like when capitalism overturned feudalism, those who benefited from the status quo were hostile to these revolutionary movements. They didn't like and didn't understand the growing resentment and unrest against their rule, and they didn't believe the common people were smart enough or organized enough to rise up on their own, just like the monarchs and aristocrats of the revolutions before them. So they turned to Illuminati theories. Lady Queenborough, an American fascist and daughter of an industrial capitalist, published Occult Theocracy in 1933, in which she praised the Klan and attributed revolutionary movements at the time to the secret societies of old. Nesta Webster, an English fascist and aristocrat, published Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, The Need for Fascism in Great Britain, in 1926, in which she claimed that a secret society of occultist Jewish people were plotting world domination through communism. Both writers combined the old Illuminati theory and anti-Semitism, arguing that the revolutionary fervor sweeping the globe was caused by a secret conspiracy of Jewish people who financed the Illuminati who descended from the ancient Knights Templar. Queenborough and Webster's conspiracy theories were later combined with the Antichrist by Gerald Winrod, an American Christian fascist, anti-Semitic evangelist, segregationist, and Hitler supporter, who argued that communism was a Jewish conspiracy that would herald the coming of the Antichrist. Whether modern Illuminati theorists recognize it or not, their theories descend from the writings of these three rich fascists, from the idea of a secret society called the Illuminati, to the financial support given by a Jewish banking syndicate, 
to the influence of ancient religious societies, to the idea of Satanist baby eaters intent on bringing the Antichrist to earth. Almost every Illuminati theory today builds off or borrows from this core story. The idea of Illuminati was used by elites to try to explain and stop movements. Anti-Semitism was used to unite poor people with their oppressors against an imagined threat. And Antichrist anticipation was used to turn reality into an apocalypse checklist we are powerless to change or stop. But if these theories were first developed by elites and other conservative forces in the past few centuries to explain challenges to their power, how did they end up being adopted by poor and oppressed people today? Our society blames poor people for being poor. But many working class folks can recognize that the blame for our circumstances lies in the institutions that keep us down and hold us back. Unfortunately, some turn to Illuminati theories originally invented by rich fascists, to explain their oppression. Take, for example, the unrest of the 1960s, when millions of black folks in the U.S. were fighting back against U.S. racial capitalism. Through that struggle against the police and National Guard, through the redistribution of goods to those in need, people developed their political consciousness and began to identify the enemies responsible for the oppression and exploitation of black people. Some, like the Panthers and other black communists, identified the enemy as white supremacist capitalism and sought to unite all peoples against this system. Others embraced myths of black supremacy, chased after black capitalism, and turned to anti-Semitism, viewing the small business owners and bankers, some of whom were Jewish, of keeping black folks down as part of a villainous Jewish conspiracy. Once the Black Liberation Movement was put down by the mid-1970s, with prominent figures dead, exiled, co-opted or imprisoned, reforms were introduced that allowed the Black capitalists and small business owners to leave poor Black folks behind. Like all capitalists, Black capitalists sought profits over people. Like all politicians, Black politicians ultimately served the interests of the machine. Most notably, Wilson Good. A black mayor in Philadelphia in 1985 oversaw the move bombing against a black radical group that killed 11 people, including children, and leveled two city blocks. Black capitalists and black politicians were in power, but racist oppression and exploitation continued for working class black folks. At the same time, national liberation movements across the globe were coming to an end. Theories of revolution and class struggle had lost popularity, leaving a political void for those in need of explanations for their oppression to be filled by Illuminati theories. When George Bush called the fall of the USSR the beginning of a new world order, conspiracy theorists adopted the term to link their multiple theories together. Originally, these theories were used by working class white folks who were confused and angry about factory closures, globalization, and the growing status of non-white people in U.S. society. They believed the government was coming to take their guns and unleash black gangs in their neighborhoods. So white right-wing militia groups like the Michigan militia grew in popularity in this time. Poor white folks, addled by a white supremacist society, blamed people of color and the Illuminati for their exploitation as working class people. With this poor analysis, they targeted the wrong enemy, terrorizing poor people of color instead of building solidarity with them. Instead of building a movement for the destruction of white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism, statism, and the liberation of all people, Illuminati theories provided poor folks, white and black, with inaccurate and immobilizing explanations of oppression and resistance. Illuminati theories just don't work. First of all, because Illuminati theories are unfalsifiable, meaning it's impossible to disprove them. No matter how much evidence you present or how many explanations you give, Illuminati theorists tend to hold fast to their explanations because they're looking for evidence to confirm what they already believe. Their automatic rebuttal to any argument is, that's just what they want you to think. But they don't realize the same non-argument could also be applied to them. Illuminati theories were literally developed by elites. I could easily speculate that elites today are purposely spreading these theories 
through social media algorithms to disempower and misinform people. Illuminati theorists are, ironically, often so blinded by a sense of elitism that they don't realize that, like the original inventors of Illuminati theories, they too see the masses as below them, as sheep, incapable of free thought or independent action. If you're actually a free thinker, you have to be able to filter the information we're bombarded with in this digital age. You have to be able to sort fact from fiction, reality from sensationalism, certitude from speculation. You have to be able to question and interrogate the explanations you have accepted to explain the world around you. Otherwise, no amount of evidence could actually change your mind. And that's just tragic. Which brings me to my next point. Illuminati theorists fail to make basic, logical arguments. It's not enough to suggest that various individuals, groups, and events are all connected. You have to demonstrate exactly how they're connected. Not only that, but your explanation can't just be possible. You also have to prove how probable it is. You have to be able to demonstrate why your theory is better than competing theories and collect evidence to back up your claims. In reality, there's plenty of evidence of what the capitalist class does on a daily basis. No shadowy Illuminati required. They're actually quite open about the ways they walk all over us and destroy the planet. Open up any newspaper, if that's still a thing people do, and read about their economic proposals. Turn on the TV and listen to their news segments. Observe their patterns of behavior and policy, particularly across party lines. Of course, they have their nasty secrets, as WikiLeaks and many brave whistleblowers have demonstrated before. But that's just it. Their secrets can be exposed by real people willing to take action against them. The ruling class is not, as many Illuminati theorists present, all-powerful. Illuminati theories refuse to leave room for mere coincidences. Somehow, every major world event from pandemics to wars to natural disasters to elections to insurrections, are all carefully planned and controlled by the Illuminati, like some malevolent pantheon of villainous gods. However, reality paints a different picture. Of course, there are prominent groups and figures that influence history, but no group or person has ever been all-powerful or all-controlling. There are always coincidences, disagreements, chance events and mistakes. In every period in history, myths have also arisen that make the rulers seem invincible. And yet the heads of many a ruler hath ruled, shattering myths of their deity. Lastly, Illuminati theories don't offer a way out of these systems of oppression and exploitation. Not only are their explanations poor, but their solutions are poor too, or non-existent. Most Illuminati theorists sit around spreading memes, forwarding messages, and complaining about the brainwashed masses. After all, if the enemy is all-powerful, there's nothing we can do but stock up and prepare for the new world order, right? Or, as some Illuminati theorists do, carry out lone wolf terrorist attacks? Otherwise, do we just have to roll over and accept our conditions? The answer is a resounding no. Armed with a proper analysis of our oppression, we can build a movement and fight back. We are not impotent. History has demonstrated again and again that masses of ordinary people have the ability to change society, for better or worse. Theories only move people to action when they provide an accurate explanation of the things they are experiencing and offer viable ways for them to act to change things. Illuminati theories offer neither. So, let's take a moment to analyze the systems that dominate us and find ways to resist and forge a better world. The best way to explain oppression and exploitation is through a theory of hierarchy as a whole, not Illuminati theory. A theory of hierarchy that connects capitalism with statism and colonialism and white supremacy and patriarchy and so on to explain how oppression and exploitation happen due to the everyday functioning of a whole interlocking network of systems. An analysis that recognizes 
that the problem is hierarchy. Whether that hierarchy manifests in the form of kings or presidents, national borders or class borders, representative democracy or dictatorship. As an anarchist, I oppose hierarchical authority, which is a social relationship and system based on status and power derived from a hierarchical position, not individual ability, that subordinates people to its will. Hierarchical social institutions include the state, private property in the class systems it reproduces, capitalism, and the institutional and interpersonal manifestations of sexism, racism, ableism, and queerphobia. These different forms of hierarchy are not independent of each other. They are interdependent. You can't completely understand any one of these systems without understanding how they relate to the others. And you can't attempt to abolish one of these systems alone and expect to create a free society. Take, for example, capitalism. Understanding how it works can help give you the analytical mindset needed to understand the other different but deeply related systems of oppression, like patriarchy and white supremacy. In our capitalist system, people are divided into two main classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, aka the working class and the capitalist class. The working class consists of people who must sell their labor for a wage, but also includes the people who depend on them, like the unemployed, disabled, their children, and others. The capitalist class controls the skills and production of the working class to gain wealth and power, and strengthen the system day after day. Capitalism requires us to sell our ability to labor in order to secure basic necessities. It alienates us from our labor, and it alienates us from other people. So instead of relating and freely sharing the fruits of our labor with others, as our ancestors did, we relate to things, to products. Instead of laboring, living, and loving as we might enjoy, we are forced to choose careers, homes, and even spouses based on dollar values. We're not forced by gunpoint, but our ancestors were. Today, we're coerced by limited options. We're coerced by a lack of free access to the resources we all need. Resources stolen from our ancestors and hoarded by a select few. Today, we justify these systems and assume they're natural and eternal, but they're not. Capital, the assets that make capitalists money, whether that's factories, intellectual property, products or stocks, comes from our everyday labor and cannot exist without it. The workers work and get a fraction of the money they generate, while the rest goes to the bosses. The more alienated labor we perform, the more capital we generate. And the more capital is produced, the more power the people who wield capital have to dominate us. Sometimes, capital is personified through managers and cops. Sometimes, capital takes the form of physical buildings. But capital itself is bigger than all of those things. Capital is not just the capitalists who run the corporations. It is the whole system. The game, with its own rules that everyone has to follow. Capital is not the Illuminati, the Antichrist, or aliens. It is a devil of our own making. It cannot exist without our arms, our legs, our reproductive organs, our brains. Therefore, we have the power to end capital, once and for all. In the past, working class people have fought to limit the vampiric power of capital to suck away their labor. That's why we have weekends and eight hour workdays. Because we fought for them. But those are just tweaks to the system. The only way to break out of the cycle of alienation, reification, exploitation and oppression is to overthrow the system. There's no individual way out. Escape into a cabin in the woods does not mean you can escape the impact of the system. There's no hustling out of it either. Even if you work for yourself, even if you be your own boss, you're still forced to sell your labor and your precious little lifetime, trying to keep up and trying to survive. As long as hierarchical institutions like capitalism and the state continue to exist, democracy is dead. Freedom is dead. We cannot take control of our lives and our society when we are forced to work for others to survive. 
Illuminati theorists blame a secret conspiracy for everything wrong with the world, when they should blame the systems that recreate capital, power, exploitation, and oppression right out in the open. The only way out is revolution, and we know it's possible because we run things. We create the force that dominates us, and we can put an end to it. We can destroy these hierarchical institutions, and we can create new ways of running society and living together with dignity, peace, and with all of our needs met. Without a ruling class, without money, without forced labor. I call this free society anarchy, and it's what I try to work towards every day. We don't need leaders to shepherd us, leaders who can be co-opted, killed, or jailed. We don't need to channel our energy through the central government, begging them for scraps of change. We cannot rely on the systems we need protection from to protect us. We need to build powerful horizontal networks that can act autonomously, rendering the authorities obsolete. We can accomplish the free society we aim for collaboratively, through strikes and sabotage, but also through constructing the world we want to live in, here and now, in our communities. If you're ready to break the chains of domination, first and foremost, find people. Find where people are struggling and build something new. As you study and expand your understanding of these systems, help expand theirs and learn from them as well. Move with intention and keep contact with those beyond your individual borders. Next, establish space. Create dedicated spaces for organized action, bringing together people, resources, and a shared motivation to build the foundation of a free world. In these spaces, learn to become resilient. Develop and share the skills, practices, and knowledge needed to prepare for new normals and increase your collective strength. Learn your own strength and learn how to use it. But don't limit yourself to small circles of like-minded revolutionaries. Expand your networks. Find people all over the world working to do the same. Establish communication. Visit, meet, and exchange so your networks grow in intelligence and power. Build upon these autonomous initiatives. Occupy space. Grow the infrastructure of our new society and find ways to feed, house, clothe, and care independently of the ruling class. Finally, become ungovernable. As the folks at Inhabit.Global describe, go on permanent strike and take everyone with you. Refuse to be managed or to manage anyone in turn. Drive a wedge down the center of society. Disavow a lifetime's worth of cynicism and resentment. Believe that it is all possible. For further reading, I've linked a couple of resources in the description to get you started. This video is largely inspired and guided by the original How to Overthrow the Illuminati, a pamphlet written by Will, Chino, Saudade, and Mamos in 2013. Take care everyone. All power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members, Wanda Jin, Novi, Liv, Vespieri, Madeline, and David Moreno. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore true. Thanks again. Peace.